Good evening. I'm going to talk about transitions. Let's start with birth. We all undergo a transition like that at the beginning of our life. In fact, um, we can imagine how it takes place if we invoke the presence of oxytocin, in fact, the love hormone. It is exactly that hormone which induces labor and eventually leads to oscillatory contractions of etc., leading to um, the happy event. Of course, I'm a physicist, and I'm not going to go into details about that particular event. Um, it's also it's too complicated to describe mathematically, and it's also sometimes controversial, like in the case of virgin birth, for example. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is move on to something simpler, like the creation of the universe. <laughs> now, of course, for a th physicist, this is quite a challenge, and it has been for a while, and indeed, um, it's much easier to model mathematically, or at least we think so. But unfortunately, I'm an experimentalist, which means it's, for me, it's very difficult to be present while it takes place. So it's very unlikely that any of us will live for long enough for this to happen again. And even if we did, uh, it's unlikely that we would survive through it uh, in order to record it in a logbook. So I think it's very unlikely that we will be able to do experiments on the event itself. So let me move on to another example of a transition which has been very much in the news recently, and that is um, the stock market transition. We call it a crash, usually. Now, <laughs> this is a typical event which takes place collectively. A bunch of people um, called um, stockbrokers or bankers essentially collectively collude towards um, raising the price of stock to the point where it becomes untenable, and essentially the whole thing, the system breaks down. So the effect of greed is virtually, uh, we, we are all familiar with, with, with that. So, um, but I'm going to illustrate the, trans the simple principles of, of phase transitions on that example. And let me go on to the case of the usual uh, supply-demand economics. That's the stuff that is supposed to work nicely. And in fact, it's very simple. You, when we increase the demand, the stock price goes up. When we de in decrease the demand, or the de demand is, uh, falls, the stock price goes down. Fine. Everything is nice and linear. Everything is well understood. Every everybody's happy. And in fact, uh, it's, it's a situation which is normally, normally present, and most economic, macroeconomics is uh, calculations are done in this way. So you adjust a little bit here, you increase the money supply, and um, you watch the inflation rate. OK, but in fact, that's only a, a very small view of what is going on. So what I've, in fact, the, the minimum complexity that we could introduce is, is shown by this curve. Now, let's do the same thing again. Let's increase demand, trading goes up. Well, sooner or later, we reach a point where things become complicated and untenable. Okay, so what's going, what happens at this point? Well, it's clear that at this point, and we know this from nonlinear system behavior, it's only a proverbial butterfly wing flap away from chaotic and um, chaotic solutions and essentially a stock market crash. So what we what happened was that in this case we go from a situation where we started with where everybody is more or less happy to a situation of total craziness into another situation where most people are unhappy, and except for a few people who may have profited from a stock, stock market crash, of course. OK, as a scientist or as a physicist, I generally dis discuss things which are more like the melting of ice or forming, of ice, uh, forming ice from water. Now, in this case, this is a phase transition which you can easily, uh, you can envisage one form, you can, you can envisage ice molecules forming a nice ordered array, and you can envisage water molecules whizzing around and kicking each other and, and so on and so forth, and that, that's, that's fine. But how can you actually go from water to ice? If you think about it, there's a, it's not so obvious, because if you take one, at a time, one molecule at a time and assemble a, 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 cu a cube of ice, that'll take an enormous amount of time. So another problem with ice is that actually there, there's not just one form. There's 15 forms of ice. And 
all of them are slightly, have a slightly different structure. So the complexity here is enormous. And even further, only the first form of ice, hexagonal ice, can form an, an, almost an infinite number of different kinds of crystals. We call them snowflakes. So nicely photographed here um, at the beginning of the previous century by um, a guy called Bentley. In fact, just a brief note, there was one occasion where one per it was reported that two snow identical snowflakes were found. In fact, this is a very, very, very rare occurrence. Okay, so what we're interested in, in is how a huge number of molecules or particles conspire to form a crystal, okay? This is what we're interested in. Now, normally what we do in, in our experiments is change the external temperature, pressure, or something like that, and watch how things crystallize. But actually, if you consider the transitions that I started with, those are actually more, in, more interesting in a sense. They're happening in time. So they're freely evolving through, we're going from one, one state to another through free evolution. And the, the idea that actually came up was that while I was driving from a very nice conference uh, in Tuscany, uh, I was driving through the, through the hills, it was a nice day, and I was wondering how one could actually set up an experiment to do exactly that, to look at the very minute details of the phase transition happening in time. Okay? In that case, instead of a thermometer, we would use a clock, or even better, um, a stopwatch, or even better, a, a very, very fast movie camera. Right? And, for, and we won't use ice or anything else. We'll use a particular type of crystal, which is shown here, which I photographed just for this. Um, and it's actually a very nice shiny metal in which normally electrons, you know, we've heard about electrons, they whiz around a bit like water molecules in a gas, okay? And then this, the special property of this crystal is that it actually likes to form, uh, a, a, the, the electrons in this crystal like to crystallize themselves. They form a regular array. This has nothing to do with the atoms themselves. They actually like to form an, a bit of an array looking a bit like that. Okay? And so what I'm going to do is study the transition from one state to another. So this was the idea that we tried to realize in the last few years. Okay? Now, unfortunately, this happens very fast, in 100 trillionths of a second, but actually that's not an impediment because we have, we have lasers which have very short laser pulses. And this is the experiment that we do. Actually, it's a very conceptually simple thing. You take your crystal, you, va you basically use a very short laser pulse to vaporize this electronic order, and then it comes back. Okay, so that, I'm going to illustrate that on my uh, schematic. You see, this is the first step is as, the, as I vaporize the crystal, you, I create again a, a, some, a random distribution of electrons, and then I'm going to watch it go back with my movie camera. Okay, and this is the actual experiment. This is what I expect to see. Now, let me now explain what we do see. First of all, we don't see a direct transition back to the original state. In fact, the crystal likes to oscillate for a while um, between two different states, okay? It's not uh, doing what we expected. And, and at the end of that oscillation, if we wait for a while, uh, we get two crystals. We don't get one crystal, we get two, okay? Strange, and there the two crystals are uh, separated by a wall. In fact, if we do something slightly different, change the conditions very slightly, we end up with a totally different crystal. So our electron order is completely different yet again. In fact, in this case, the electron order, order has nothing to do with any kind of order that we can reach just by adjusting temperature or pressure. So it's a really a new a hidden state which doesn't exist in this world or in this universe unless we reach it with a specific laser, uh, laser sequence. Okay, now, Another situation that occurs, if we change the parameters slightly, we get a multiple crystal, we get three different kinds of crystal forming after the, it relaxes. And the next event is if, if we wait, wait for three trillionths of a second, which is quite long, in fact, the, the walls in the crystal annihilate. Okay? They emit energy, and the energy that's released is in the form of a particle which is mathematically very closely analogous to the, the famous Higgs boson. Now, how does that work? 
In our case, we had a, a laser which induced electron plasma, which then cooled uh, with the emission of energy, right? In the LHC collider in, at CERN, um, it's slightly different. They don't use a laser. They, they, they use two elementary particles which interact, and they form a pl hot plasma. And once they do that, they also release energy. And if they re do this in the right experiment, they can actually record the particles that come out. And one of these particles, which has been discovered and for which the Nobel Prize was rewarded uh, just this week, um, is the Higgs boson. Okay? Now, at this point, I think it's, very, it's worth noting that the original idea and the original inspiration for the model and the theory for the Higgs boson, which is, was awarded the Nobel Prize back in the early 60s, actually came from a model describing a, yet another transition. And that is, I'm not going to go into the details of that one today, but it's the transition from a normal metal to a superconductor. And the, the, the analogies in these cases are all relying on nonlinearity. OK, now let's go back to our nice little uh, example which we, had, we started with, um, the um, Big Bang. OK, um, if we carry on this analogy, it's very difficult at this point for a physicist to predict whether, uh, how far these analogies can go. But we can certainly uh, speculate. And the analogy would be that when we go through the Big Bang, in fact, what is happening is not that we are uh, going, through, um, uh, uh, going through the Big Bang once, but in fact, the universe is oscillating on a very short time scale. And eventually, when it decides what it wants, it may form a new universe and an anti-universe. Or it may form a multiple universes. And when these annihilate, again, we get the same kind of particles or the same kind of energy release as we did in our experiment. OK, now, we also saw another crystal forming. OK, now that was a very peculiar case in which a state was reached which is not normally accessible. It doesn't normally exist. We can't predict its, its existence in advance because it's only reached through a per very particular route. And this is the case if, imagine that we went through the Big Bang and there was another universe created which is totally different, in which we are actually, we're not people, but butterflies. Okay, let me now finish off by go going back to the original ex um, example which I used of course, in a very oversimplified fashion to illustrate the principles. Um, I, put, I was very happy to, see, to find this picture here, which shows oscillations prior to the um, stock market crash. Now, in actual data, there are oscillations of the stock market prices. There are actually many reasons for them, and it's not clear at this point whether we can associate them to the same mechanism. But nevertheless, if we could, we could anticipate the proximity of a transition uh, by understanding how it takes place. Now, on the other hand, if we want to keep things steady, if we are interested in keeping things, uh, how shall I, not having too many stock market crashes, the message is very simple. We have to keep things linear, and we do that by simply putting a very large tax on greed. OK, so this, these experiments have been going on only for a few years, and I, it's really very exciting for us, uh, so that means me and my colleagues, um, that we've been able to find so many different interesting cases. Just in one particular example, um, it's certainly um, what we were very happy with, with was that the first publication of this uh, of these results, in a, which appeared on a cover of a nature journal, uh, actually helped um, get, attract funding. And that was wonderful because it means that the team can now work on science and not on filling in forms for new applications for money and filling in reports and so on and so forth. So we actually work on the uh, science. Now, it's very early to predict what else we can observe. And certainly there's one um, interesting um, aspect which we'd like to investigate, and that's the, the presence of dark matter. The, the idea is to draw analogies between different systems and then uh, look at how, these how this behavior is repeated. Now, 
Remember the oscillations in the contractions of, at birth? Well, it turns out the, 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 the analogy actually goes quite deep. The origin in both cases is the nonlinearity of the system. Okay, let me finish off by, by quoting uh, Douglas Adams in his uh, Hitchhiker's Guides of the Galaxy, where he says at some point that the universe was created in the beginning, which generally made a lot of people very angry and was generally thought to be a very bad thing. Now, in our case, we do these experiments on many different systems. Uh, in fact, the experiment is repeated about 100,000 times a second. So maybe not every one of these is a bad thing. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.